and welcome to this video on uh, Alkanes. This is for OCRA. Uh, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and basically this video is just a revision video. It's designed to give you a uh, just a quick overview of the um, topic of Alkanes for OCRA. Um, the slides that I've made here that um, you can actually use to supplement your revision print them off, write notes on them, etc. They can be purchased. If you click on the um, the link in the description box below this video, uh, it'll take you to the place where you can get a hold of them. Uh, like I say, this one is for uh, OCR Air. This is very specific to the exam board, and it does match the specification points that are listed here. Um, so this is obviously taken for the syllabus. So if you're studying OCR, you should be okay with this one. Okay, so we're going to do uh, an introduction to alkanes first. We're going to see what they are. So alkanes are all saturated hydrocarbons. They have the general formula CnH2n plus 2. Okay, so they are hydrocarbons. They contain hydrogen and carbon only. They are saturated, which means each carbon is bonded four times uh, with the maximum number of hydrogens possible. So we've got some examples there, as you can see. We've got methane on the left, ethane in the middle, propane on the right. So these are just all examples of alkanes. Cycloalkanes are a little bit different though. They don't have the general formula CnH2n plus 2. They actually have the same general formula as an alkene actually, uh, mainly because they loop round on each other and they lose two hydrogens obviously to, to enable them to do that. So um, there's an example of cyclopentane. So it's basically pentane just uh, looped around in a circle. Uh, Cytoalkanes are still saturated though, even though they don't have the same general formula. Um, again, they have maxed out their bonds with hydrogens. Each carbon has anyway, so there's no double bonds in there. So there's all single bonds. Okay, so the shape of alkane molecules. Okay, alkanes always form a tetrahedral shape. So you remember this from the bonding topic about shape. So this is around the carbon atom. So we can have a look here. So the angle around each bond is 109.5. Um, and obviously this is an example of methane. So alkanes have a specific shape because all of these bonds repel each other equally. Okay. So because they repel each other equally, they want to be as far away from each other as possible because uh, obviously they're all made of electrons. So in that, for that reason, they get a very defined shape and a very defined angle as well. So the angle here between the bond is 109.5. So really important that you need to know about the shape of alkanes. They're all tetrahedral. So the bigger the molecule of an atom, um, the more induced dipole-dipole forces you have and the larger, because you have larger electron clouds. Okay, so we're looking at the length of these molecules. Okay, so remember when we boil a liquid, we are actually breaking the weak forces between them. We're not actually breaking any bonds between the hydrocarbon and the alkane. We're actually just weakening the forces between them okay so we've got to have enough energy to overcome these forces and basically if we have a molecule that doesn't have any branching and in other words they're just bog standard straight chain molecules these can pack really closely together we get a good amount of surface contact now you can see this fuzziness around the carbon skeleton this is kind of showing the electron clouds around the atoms and bonds and you can see here we've got quite a bit of overlap here so that means we've got a quite good strong interaction between these molecules, between these uh, alkane chains. So these longer straight chain hydrocarbons, they have more induced dipole-dipole forces or London forces is also known as. More energy is needed to overcome these. This means the boiling point for the longer chain alkanes increase. Branching though, as you can see here, this weakens the uh, induced dipole-dipole forces between them because they can't pack as closely together. So you can see here we've got these branches sticking out here. And you can see the only real bit where we get a bit of overlap is round here and round here. Other than that, there's no not much overlap between these. So this obviously weakens the um, intermolecular force, the um, induced dipole-dipole force between these molecules, and it lowers their boiling point for any molecules that are branched. Okay, obviously... Alkanes are useful as fuels. They can be burnt. So they can burn in oxygen. And if there's enough oxygen there, they can form carbon dioxide and water. And we call this complete combustion. So they're really good fuels. They produce loads of energy, like I say. Um, and basically, they're used to power vehicles. So put petrol, for example, and diesel into cars. You can make electricity from burning oil uh, and gas power stations. So they're all really useful. Loads of energy, packed full of energy. And the equation to show this of complete combustion is, uh, this is butane 
reacting with 6.5 moles of oxygen to form carbon dioxide and water. Be prepared to write out an equation to show the combustion of an alkane and obviously be prepared to balance it as well. Okay, so we can um, use these combustion equations as well. And basically, when we produce hydrocarbon, um, or when, so when we burn a hydrocarbon, we produce gases at the same temperature and pressure. Uh, and we can use the volume ratio um, to work out the formula of the hydrocarbon being burnt, which is obviously pretty useful. So let's have a look at this example. So we've got 15 centimeters cubed of hydrocarbon A burns completely and 120 centimeters cubed of oxygen. Okay, so we've got 75 centimetres cubed of carbon dioxide is produced. What is the molecular formula of hydrocarbon A? Okay, so first thing, using the information, we need to write a volume ratio equation. Now, um, what we've got here is 15 centimetres cubed of hydrocarbon A burns completely in 120 centimetres cubed of oxygen. So there it is there, 120 centimetres cubed of O2. 75 centimetres cubed of carbon dioxide is produced. So that's why I put 75 CO2. What is the molecular form of hydrocarbon A? We don't know how much water is because they haven't told us. So all we've done is we've written down our volume ratio equation. Then we're going to simplify all of this lot, okay, because these numbers are quite large. So in this case, they are all uh, factors of 15. So uh, we could simplify it. So we've just got 1A, 8O2, 5CO2. And again, we don't know the number of um, the volume of water produced, but we've simplified it. So it's a little bit neater. Number three, right, what we've got is we've got eight moles of oxygen. These are reacting to form five moles of carbon dioxide, okay? So we're just going to convert these into moles and look at them as a, as a ratio, okay? And N moles for water. So any oxygen um, that isn't in CO2 must be in water, okay? So that's quite important. So because obviously oxygen appears in both of them, so any oxygen that isn't here must have been taken up from here. So this will give us an idea. So basically the number here is eight times two, okay, because we've got two lots of oxygen here, minus the amount of oxygen that's in our carbon dioxide, which is five times two, because again, we've got two lots of oxygen here. So the amount of oxygen that's in water must be six. So literally we're just finding the difference. We know we had eight lots of O2 going in. We've got five lots going here. And basically whatever's left is six. So basically just trying to make sure the number of oxygens add up, they balance. So that's going to be six. So the combustion equation is this. A plus 8O2 will give 5CO2 plus 6H2O. So then to identify A, all the carbon in A will make carbon dioxide. And all the number of hydrogens in A must be 12 because we've got six lots of H2O. You can see... Um, obviously you can see there we've got um, we've just worked that out there it is we've got six lots of h2o so we must have 12 hydrogens so our hydrocarbon must have uh, five carbons and it must have 12 hydrogens okay because it's the only place where these carbons and hydrogens come from is come from a so the formula of a is c5 h12 and it's pretty much as simple as that. But just make sure you follow this procedure really carefully because it can get a little bit tricky. Try and simplify where you need to and basically using your volume ratio, same as your mole ratio as well, okay? Because we can use the, remember it's just a ratio, so we can use it as the same. Okay, incomplete combustion. Okay, so this is when we take off fuel and we it doesn't burn with a plentiful supply. So unlike the other two slides we're talking about complete, this is incomplete. So if we burn it with a limited supply of oxygen, we produce carbon monoxide, CO, and carbon, which is soot, and we get incomplete combustion occurring. Now, obviously, we can write these equations as shown here, and they can ask for a variety of different types. This top one's basically just showing the uh, incomplete combustion of, of butane. We're producing carbon monoxide and water. They'll tell you which which product you're going to produce obviously carbon monoxide is a gas sometimes we can get it where it produces carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide at the same time so we can get this split product produced so carbon monoxide though is poisonous it's not good it bonds to hemoglobin in your blood and it prevents the oxygen from bonding so it's displacing it um, and basically we can remove this carbon monoxide that's being produced by using a catalytic converter in a car that converts it into carbon dioxide uh, here's just another uh, equation showing an incomplete combustion. This time we're producing soot instead of uh, carbon monoxide. So there's your butane, and we're going to react that with this time two and a half oxygens, and we're going to form four lots of carbon 
and 5H2O. Okay, so it's just another equation. So make sure you can balance these as well. And obviously soot isn't very good for you either. Um, it uh, makes buildings dirty, you get filthy windows, but even worse than that, it causes breathing problems. Uh, those people who are asthmatic, you'll probably, um, you'll probably uh, know this all too well about, um, you know, especially in cities and busy cities um, where you've got um, large amounts of pollution from cars. Um, and basically this will cause breathing problems and this stuff isn't very good when you're breathing it in. Okay, so we look at bond fission. So we've got two types of bond fission here. We've got homolytic and heterolytic. So bond fission is basically just the breaking of a covalent bond. Um, and so the electron pair in the bond can be distributed in two ways. Uh, we can get heterolytic fission. Like I say, this is basically where we've got um, electrons in the bond are basically moving from one side to the molecule. Um, and that leaves us with a negative uh, ion and a positive ion here. So make sure you're able to comment on bond fission and you can talk about obviously how, how bonds can break uh, in, in particular for alkanes. Okay, so this is what we call a heterolytic, hetero meaning different. So we're producing two different products here, a positive and a negative. We use a double headed arrow to represent that. Homolytic fission is basically where the bond breaks evenly. Um, so we've basically got two radicals being formed. Um, you can see these are uncharged. Homo meaning the same. So one electron goes this way, one electron goes that way, and we form an X dot and a Y dot. The dot is a radical, really reactive. Um, but again, these are the same. We're forming two radicals. So these, we'll call it homo, which is homolytic fission. Breaking the bond to produce two products which are the same. Okay, leading on to that then, we need to know about free radical chain reactions, okay? So a chain reaction involves three main stages, initiation, propagation, and termination. Now these steps are basically brought about by homolytic fission, that last one that we'd seen before, the one with the radicals being formed. So initiation is basically radicals are produced normally by visible light or UV, ultraviolet. We call this a photochemical reaction because we're using photons, which is like light, and obviously we're using chemicals because we're breaking them using light. Uh, and basically the bond breaks producing two radicals. Propagation stages is where a radical collides with a non-radical uh, and what we produce is a radical and a non-radical. Um, and because the radical is still there, this radical can then react with other non-radicals and that will then in turn produce more radicals and non-radicals. So there's, there's radicals all over the place. And basically these things keep reacting and we call this a chain reaction. And this chain reaction bit is the propagation stage. It is true until we get termination. Now, if two radicals come together, though, uh, we form a non-radical and that kills the, the chain reaction. Chain reaction doesn't go anymore. We formed a non-radical and that's it. And we call that termination because it's obviously ended the reaction. Now, obviously, we're going to put this into a, a, a context and we're going to put this into the context of making a halogenoalkane from an alkane. So chloromethane can be made using this reaction here. So we've got methane plus chlorine, UV light forming chloromethane and HCl. We need to know the reactions of these. So initiation, remember, was the first step. So sunlight breaks the CLCL bond in a process called photodissociation. Very posh, basically just breaking a bond using light. Okay, the bond breaks equally, producing two highly reactive radicals. So here we go, there's your chlorine molecule. UV light's gonna come in, it's gonna break this bond homolytically, and we're gonna get two chlorine radicals produced. Propagation, okay, so what happens is the chlorine radical produced here will react with a methane molecule to make the methyl radical. Then that methyl radical reacts with an unreacted chlorine molecule and that will form chloromethane and your Cl dot radical. I'll show you this as a step. And then this Cl radical then can react with more methane. So it's a chain reaction. So let's have a look at the first step. Here it is here. Chlorine radical reacting with your methane. This will produce your methyl radical CH3 dot and HCl. Okay, so you can see the radical is now moved from the Cl onto the CH3 dot. The hydrogen that was on here is now bonded with the um, chlorine. The radical of this step will be the reactant of the next step. So let's have a look. There it is there. So there's the radical product is now the reactant of the next step. This reacts with any unreacted chlorine to form your chloromethane, which is there. 
and crucially we formed our chloride our chlorine radical back now the product the radical product of step two must be a reactant of the radical a radical reactant in step one so these must link together otherwise something has gone wrong and basically this will then react and keep on reacting and this is what we call a chain reaction so it goes around in a loop just make sure you're looking out for them little checks as well Okay, and the final step is termination. So this is where we get two radicals reacting, and these form a much stable non-radical molecule. So they could get a few of these. Basically, you just take any two radicals that you've got here and add them together, and basically you get your um, you get your compound. Now, um, that one should say chloromethane, okay, because obviously we're making chloromethane, not bromomethane. It's a bit of a mistake. So we're making chloromethane. So, for example, here it is here. So we've got a methyl radical and a chlorine radical. They're going to react together to form your um, uh, chloromethane, which is here. Okay, so that's the name of your product. You can have bromomethane, um, obviously if it was bromine, but these examples we're using chlorine. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the products of free radical reactions, because you're going to get a few different things here. Um, so it's not quite as straightforward as you may think, unfortunately. So... Producing just chloromethane is actually pretty difficult, okay? We keep on getting these further reactions and we produce a mixture of different products, which is very annoying if you just want to make chloromethane. Um, so let's have a look and see what we've got. So we've got loads of chlorine, okay, in the reaction mixture. So we've got an excess of chlorine. What we'll get is multiple substitution. We get di, tri, and tetra uh, haloalkane, which isn't brilliant, to be honest. So and you can see a reaction here just to kind of show that. There's the, look, there's the haloalkane that we've just made. Unfortunately, because there's some chlorine radicals knocking around, we've got loads of them because we've got an excess. These react with this. It forms CH2Cl dot and your HCl. Remember your radical product from the first step is the radical reactant in the second. That reacts with more unreacted chlorine. It's basically the same as before. And we produce a dichloromethane. Um, and a radical, obviously you've got your dichloromethane there. Um, and the product dichloromethane, this can then react further to make trichloromethane. You can see there's the same reaction, so you get trichloromethane. And guess what? The trichloromethane can react further to make tetrachloromethane um, and so on. So it just keeps on reacting until you've got all substitution happening. So with free radical substitution, you make chloromethane, dichloromethane, trichloromethane, and tetrachloromethane. These all have to be separated because obviously these are now impurities. You don't get a pure form of your chloromethane that you initially thought you were going to get. So that's a bit annoying. Okay, so we're going to have to separate them. What we can do, though, is we can try and um, reduce the chance of this... Um, um, this multiple substitution if we don't want it. And basically, what we have to do is add excess methane instead. Uh, this reduces the amount of multiple substitutions because we've got loads of methane for the chlorines to react with. So we've got a greater chance of chlorine reacting with the methane, like we say. So in addition to multiple substitution as well, we've got isomers formed. Um, this is because free radical substitution can occur anywhere in a hydrocarbon. So obviously, you wouldn't get this with your methane, but if you had um, a... a pentanes and butanes etc obviously you can get numerous points in where that radical can react so you might get one chlorobutane two chlorobutane so pretty much these radical reactions may look good on the face of it really reactive producing your product quickly really uh, easy to start it just uv however as you can see they're a victim of their own success because they're so reactive they will react with any of these things as well okay so we've got any of these um obviously all these um, haloalkanes, the they different isomers, etc. Loads of different products being produced that you may not want. Okay, and that's it. Uh, that's just a quick overview to alkanes for OCRA. Um, I much appreciate it if you can support this channel just by clicking on the little button in the middle to subscribe and you get all the updates on the videos uh, through YouTube as well. And don't, remember, uh, don't forget that you can also purchase these PowerPoints for your revision uh if you just click on the link in the description box you can get a hold of it there but that's it now bye bye